Afterwards, there's probably time for everybody to ask um, one or more questions if they'd like to. So I was asked to speak about our social equity program in Massachusetts, which is the first of its type. And I'll start with just the background about the Cannabis Control Commission. Everybody can hear me, right? Okay. So um, we're actually a, we were not the first state to legalize marijuana, of course, but we were the first state to try this model, which is a brand new state agency. Originally, um, under the ballot initiative that the voter passed, the agency was going to be under the office of the treasurer. But when the legislature changed the law, they created the Cannabis Control Commission to be a brand new agency created um, first with five people with five different areas of expertise. Public health, business and finance, government relations, social, excuse me, government regulations, social justice, which is my piece, and public safety. And the idea there is that the five of us would make our decisions from those five perspectives in public, open and transparent, and without any outside political influences. So that is largely how it has been run. Um, I'm very happy with that model. I have suggested to other states that they try and, um, and replicate. A little bit about my background. I am largely known as the one member of the commission that voted for legalization. I also helped to draft um, the original ballot initiative. I have been very pleased to find out that all of my colleagues are just as committed to quickly and efficiently and safely and equitably implementing the legislation as I am. Um, my background is specifically in marijuana, so I started with activism to legalize marijuana for medical patients and for um, everyone over 21 when I was in college. And in 2012, after I graduated law school, I was lucky enough to work on the Colorado campaign that legalized marijuana for the first time. And um, watching how that played out and the other first states, it was striking that uh, we could have done we could do better with the, the states that came afterward. Um, and making sure there was a diverse industry was one of the biggest lessons to come out of those first few states. So when I got back to Massachusetts, I practiced business law for a while for marijuana firms. And at that time, under the medical program, you couldn't even apply unless you paid a $30,000 non-refundable application fee. And there was also, I believe, a half a million dollar capital requirement. And so it would just be consultation after consultation, often small businesses telling them that they were not going to be able to even apply. And that was frustrating. That definitely created a passion in me that for future laws, we should try to make it as inclusive and as accessible as possible. So I got out of business law and I started a recruiting firm and that was focused on diversity and inclusion. That was a lot more productive uh, for me because I was able to match companies that were truly interested in the business benefits of having a diverse staff to people who were interested in working there and people who had marijuana expertise, whether from the legal market or the underground market. So after that, um, in 2015, I got the chance to give input and work with a coalition to draft the legalization question. And um, in particular, with my colleague Chanel Lindsay, we were the two people of color on the committee. We drafted a first in the nation provision that required that communities disproportionately harmed by prohibition would have to be included in the new industry. And um, we did not define what that meant at the time. And I didn't know I was going to have to be the, the one to um, figure out how to define that, but I'll talk about how that went. So this is the commission, this is what our meetings look like. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it was very important to the legislature that created our agency and to the five of us that all of our decisions are made in public. Because of the open meeting law, we're actually not allowed to talk to each other in a quorum. So three of us can't talk to each other about any particular issue unless it's in an open meeting. So for the last year, um, every time that we wanted to talk about any issue, we've waited until there was a meeting and done it in front of a crowd, which can be very stressful for us, but 
the function of that is everyone can see um, in real time how our five different perspectives make the decision and also how your input as the public will influence it. Um, there was one time when we were talking about environmental regulations and I got a tweet the night before um, that suggested a different way we might be able to approach it for small businesses um, and I brought that up in the meeting and it ended up passing. Um, there's a lot of other times when we have open public comment periods and all five of us read the comment and then when we come together in the meeting, we talk about how that public comment affected the way that we made the decision because we all know a lot about this, but the five of us definitely don't know everything, and public comment means a lot to us. On that note, I'll mention that we're actually having a public comment period right now that just started. On Thursday, we had a discussion about local control. So every license that comes to the commission, every application for a license, first has to get local approval at the city or town level. and. Um, with license applications having been out for a few months, uh, we're starting to see that um, that process is raising a lot of questions. And so we have issued draft guidance. So our website is masscannabiscontrol.com. If you go to masscannabiscontrol.com, I'll have a slide on that later, you can click on guidance, you can look at that guidance, and you can send us your public comment. We'll be taking it for the next week up until Monday, August 6th at 5 p.m. Then we'll take the next few days to make sure that they're all organized, we've read them, um, we're familiar with what the public thinks, and then on that Thursday, Monday, August 9th, we'll make our decision. Um, and this is generally the way that we make decisions. Um, I often tell people when they ask, you know, how can we follow this? Um, or they'll even just say, I feel like this is unfair, I don't know what's going on. Well, it's really up to you to find out what's going on because we have made all of this information public. Um, if you can't make the meeting because it's held during the day, you can watch the live stream. Martina's live streaming right now um, on our Facebook page. You can also um, look at our social media. You can look at our website. You can look at my personal Twitter where I try and put in as plain language as possible what's going on at the meetings and what your um, opportunity to put in your input will be. Because really, we only get one chance to do this the first time, right? So if we don't get it right, then it will always be about fixing it. So I'll start telling you now about um, our decisions and our regulations. And um, again, I was asked to speak about the social equity program, so I will be discussing um, our regulations through that lens. But if you want to know more about our regulations in general, you can go to our website, you can ask me about it in the Q&A. So in terms of equity and our legislative mandate to make sure that this is a fair industry, before we even got to the point of a formal equity program, it was important to make sure that the program was fair to begin with, so that businesses of all sizes, no matter who they are, no matter what their background was, would get a fair shot. So um, the first thing that was in the state law is that there are no caps on licenses at the state level. If you look at some other states, um, especially some of the early ones, you will see structures where there are a limited number of licenses and then everybody has to just fight for them and it's, it's a competition. Um, in my experience, that's really bad for equity. It really um, encourages bad behavior uh, for otherwise well-meaning applicants. So in our law, the application is looked at independently. Is it suitable or is it not suitable? Does it meet the requirements or does it not meet the requirements? and then we make the decision. So there's no, there's no competition against each other. Secondly, there are no numerical capital requirements. So you do have to show that you have a source of capital so that you can run a business. That's one of the things we need to look for. Um, but there's no number on it because every business is different and every business plan is different. Third, this is something we actually um, picked up both from the fact that it's 2018 and you need to have a diverse workforce to run a business today. And also Pennsylvania's medical marijuana program had a similar requirement. 
And it's just that as part of your application, you have to describe your plan to make sure that you have a diverse workforce, that you'll include women, people of color, veterans, um, people with disabilities, um, LGBTQ community, and uh, making sure that everyone has a fair chance to work at your company. Fourth, we developed a new program that is a way to incentivize companies to go above and beyond, and a way to signal to consumers who want to make conscious consumer choices that they can support those companies. So there are a number of ways that you can get designated um, with leadership uh, status, and specifically for social justice leadership status, um, it has to do with donating to our technical assistance fund that helps equity applicants, and giving seminars where you share your knowledge with others. And those who meet that will be able to put a special seal on their products, and the customers who want to support those companies will be able to do so. Fifth, part of our law requires us to make a positive impact on the community disproportionately harmed by prohibition. We decided to allow companies to participate in that in any way they want and to encourage innovation. And so with their application, they're required to include a positive impact plan. We just issued guidance on what the elements of that plan would look like on Thursday. So that's on our website. And basically it says the elements of a plan, according to the dictionary definition, are the goal, the steps you'll take to get there, and how you will measure if you met your goals. Um, we also have several examples of ways that you could um, make such a program, but it's really open-ended. And then sixth, we had a variety of license types to make sure that this market is open to all different kinds of businesses. So we have tiers of cultivation that go all the way up to the top cultivation limits, and then we have micro-businesses that get um, special fee discounts um, and a vertically integrated license, which means you could both cultivate and manufacture under the one license, as long as it's under that small amount. And that's meant to encourage small businesses. Similarly, craft cooperatives are a way to encourage farmers to be able to share their resources and um, operate under one cooperative license. So all of those policies were before we even get to the formal equity program. This is the exact language from the law. The first one is the language that we interpreted to um, design our equity program. It says that we're required to promote and encourage full participation in the marijuana industry by people from communities that have been disproportionately harmed. And we've largely interpreted that to mean technical assistance, and fee waivers. I'll get into those details. And then secondly, and totally separately, I'm going to add, because these two programs often get conflated, but they are separate programs. They have separate eligibility requirements. You could apply, you could be eligible for both, or one or the other, or neither, but they're separate benefits. So priority review um, is because the law requires the commission to prioritize the review and licensing decisions for applicants who demonstrate experience in or business practices that promote economic empowerment in communities disproportionately impacted. And so back at the very beginning, before we opened the application process to everybody, we allowed applicants to demonstrate that they have that experience or business practices. There are 123 who met that criteria, and the benefit for them is that when they do apply, they will go straight to the front of the line to be reviewed. So introducing the equity program, the first question is what is equity? And this is a case where it's easier to demonstrate it <clears throat> visually than through words. You can see that equality is about sameness, equity is about fairness. And in this particular context, I would describe it as recognizing the harms that have come to certain communities through marijuana prohibition and then making appropriate accommodations just as has been done with the bicycles in this picture. So when we had to define communities disproportionately harmed, the first step was to 
look at research and look at evidence. So you can actually find, if you look at our website, the studies that we use to define the geographic areas that were community disproportionately harmed. That was primarily based on a study of arrest rates. But this is to demonstrate generally um, the racial disparities in arrests and the criminal justice system in general. If you look at this bar graph, you can see that when decriminalization passed in 2008, the arrests were much higher, but the disparities are about the same as they were in 2016. So the arrests went down dramatically, but the disparities between the people who were being arrested, specifically black and white people, either remained the same or got worse. And on the right side, you can see ACLU statistics that show the population percentage that's black and Latino versus the people sentenced to prison, the people serving sentences for mandatory minimum drug offenses. And it's very important to note that black and Latino people use and sell drugs at largely the same rates as other people. So that has translated somewhat to disparities in representation in the cannabis industry. This is from Marijuana Business Daily as of um, one year ago, August 2017. You can see that 81% of cannabis business owners and founders identify as white. And this is largely what we are trying to address with the equity program. It's very clear from this data that we need to be intentional and deliberate about addressing this problem. On the right, you can see the key barriers to entry that were identified. I'll note that we just did our own survey of the econ empowerment applicants that I had mentioned. So out of 123, only three have submitted all four application packets. And um, that is a big concern for us because the more licenses we issue, the less meaningful that benefit of priority becomes. So we started by issuing a survey, asking them to tell us what the biggest barriers to entry were for them. And the preliminary data is consistent with this. The three top barriers that they identified were um, raising funds or capital and um, developing a business concept or plan, which for many people the equity program should help with. And then third, getting through the local control process. My favorite thing about this law is something that I did not even write. The legislature added it. They added some very strong accountability measures to make sure that the Cannabis Control Commission ensures that there's meaningful participation from these different communities, specifically minority women and veteran business enterprises. We have to keep track of that, report to the legislature, and if we don't provide for the meaningful participation, then we have to take remedial measures. And certainly a big part of that will be directly addressing the barriers to entry that have been identified. On the right are the examples of the remedial measures that are stated in the law. And as you can see from what I've described already, we've largely proactively already adopted these programs. So the purpose of the social equity program in general is to create and build sustainable pathways into the cannabis industry for both individuals and businesses. When we started out, we made sure that we heard from communities directly that we were trying to benefit. So not only did we have events like this and invite public comment, but we went into several of the communities themselves, held evening hearings, the first one I held was a day hearing, and I've never gotten yelled at as much as I did for holding something during the day. So <laughs> learned my lesson. We held evening hearings. Um, we invited emails. We invited public comment. And one thing that we heard very consistently is that people did not want a one-size-fits-all program. They were in different places. Some absolutely wanted ownership only. Others were not interested in ownership and wanted to be workers. Others wanted to know how they could apply their skills in another trade um, with, uh, to the cannabis industry. And so our goal here is to pair 
um, the applicants with the qualified vendors who provide training um, based on those different areas of need. So where we are right now in the program is actually recruiting those vendors. So if you are with a company that you think is capable of providing that training, um, designing a curriculum in any of these areas, and either providing the training in person or digitally or both, I would encourage you to check out our RFQ, which is now available. It closes September 7th. And you can find it if you go to masscannabiscontrol.com and click on social equity programs. There's a tab that explains the RFQ. I also did a Facebook Live recently with our executive director going through the RFQ. It can be a little bit intimidating if you just open it as 25 pages, but a lot of that is just um, boilerplate business stuff. So you can watch our video if you wanna know more about that. And then finally, the program will create a pipeline and dedicated connector for job seekers and employers who are seeking to employ them. So this gets to the heart of the very difficult question we had to answer, which is how do you define communities disproportionately harmed? So as I mentioned, we first looked at geographic areas based on arrest rates. We identified 29 areas of disproportionate impact. Um, most of those are cities or towns. In the four biggest cities, Boston, Worcester, Springfield, and Lowell on our list, it did not make sense to include the whole city because it was very clearly certain <coughs> neighborhoods. So we identified those neighborhoods by census tract. And again, you'll sense the theme, if you go to masscannabiscontrol.com and click on guidance, you can see exactly what those areas are. I'll also mention that we included five of the past 10 years, rather than just current residency, to account for gentrification because the data that we were looking at um, of arrests went back through even before decriminalization and after. And then the second and third criterion really address head on that the communities disproportionately harmed are the people who got arrested or were incarcerated and have drug convictions. So no matter where you live, um, if you are a resident and you have a drug conviction or you are married to or the child of a person who had a drug conviction, you would be eligible for this program. I would flag that we separately have suitability requirements and that will explain what the background check requirements are and certain um, backgrounds that would exclude you from being in the marijuana industry. So I would encourage you to look at our regulations. I will say though, if you have any kind of marijuana offense, as long as it didn't involve distribution to a minor, you'll be eligible for the program. So I mentioned earlier that this is not a one-size-fits-all program. It is divided into tracks. There are four tracks. The first is for entrepreneurs, and the most clearly identified help that they need is developing their concept and their business plan. There's also navigating the application themselves and legal compliance and tax compliance, several other areas. The core track is for those who are interested in the managerial and executive level. The re-entry and entry level is for those who are largely starting in a job for the first time, for the first time recently. And then the ancillary track is for trade professionals or ancillary professionals. So if you have HVAC skills or if you have software, technology, bookkeeping skills, and you wanna know how you can get into the cannabis industry specifically, you would receive training on that. I've discussed the goals of the program already. Um, as I've discussed, the benefits are largely focused on technical assistance, fee waivers, and then the third bullet point is about social consumption and delivery licenses in particular. Those were licenses that our commission had initially approved in our draft regulations last year. After a period of public comment, it was very clear that many in the public did not feel ready for those licenses to move forward. And so when we came back to discuss it, we came up with a compromise where we would delay those licenses to be discussed after another public comment period, we would make evidence-based decisions addressing each of the concerns that had been raised, 
And to account for the equity concerns, they would initially only be issued to small businesses and equity applicants. So if you're interested in that process, you definitely want to follow along this fall. Um, we'll be discussing those concerns I mentioned over the next few months and then holding hearings in the fall and then making a decision by February 2019. Question? Sure. Yeah. How is the, uh, it sounds like it's taking a while and I'm wondering how that pace is keeping track with uh, what's happening in the industry. So how, like as the industry is, is evolving and maybe it's, it's taken a while, I understand how long these things take, but still, there's an interest in speed. Mm -hmm. So how does that factor? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, as a former lawyer who represented marijuana businesses, that you have to comply with the law and you have to match the speed that the law and regulations are taking. So you can get involved in the process to form them. You can certainly get ready, but the industry wouldn't be able to move ahead of where the law is. Does that help? Great. So this is an overview of the application. Um, the bolded parts are where you would have to show that you meet the requirements for the program. Um, the rest of it is largely us collecting data. Um, once we have determined the vendors and training that will be providing the, um, the bulk of the technical assistance, we'll be opening the application and this will be an ongoing program. So unlike the economic empowerment program that was only open for the two weeks, um, this will be open on an ongoing basis. As I mentioned, the law requires us to measure the outcomes. These are the metrics that we'll be using to determine how the program is going. Um, I'll say from my perspective, given that this is the first statewide equity program, and I know a lot of other states and even countries have um, openly stated that they're watching this, for me, it's much more important that we are open about the data and we release it without any kind of filtering. It doesn't matter to me if it's flattering or not. What matters to me is that we show what we did and how it ended up so that others can improve on the program, just like we're improving on the previous states that legalized. These are the next steps. I mentioned earlier that we have an RFQ open until September 7th, and these are the areas of expertise You'll see at the end that there is an other category. If you feel in particular that you have worked with these populations and you have a curriculum in mind, by all means, you should apply. I would love to see a combination of vendors that have worked with state governments previously and vendors who have never applied um, for in a state RFQ or RFP before. Um, you can also include multiple areas in your curriculum, or you can include just one of them. Um, you can also show, preferably, that you're able to go around the state and provide this training, or if you're focused in one area as well. Question? Um, this is actually just my last slide, and then I'll move to questions. Um, so, masscannabiscontrol, masscannabiscontrol.com, excuse me, slash social equity is our page specifically on this program. You can see a lot of the resources that I've mentioned, um, the RFQ, and then very importantly, because I know nobody has time to go to a website every day and check, you can sign up for an email list, and when there's a development, we will email you. And then we also just have a general email list um, that you can sign up for if you go to masscannabiscontrol.com and you'll find out about new developments. And then, as I mentioned, you can follow us on our Facebook page or our Twitter page, you can email us. If you do want to uh, participate in the public comment period that I mentioned, this is the email address to do it. Um, we are specifically looking for small businesses, no, excuse me, I am specifically looking for small businesses and entrepreneurs that have tried to go through the local control process. Tell me what happened, what municipality it was, um, and exactly the specifics so that, like I said, we can bring that up when we have our discussion. Um, I think we have a lot more information now than we did back in, in December when this uh, hadn't started. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for the new people, you can follow me on Twitter. I do my best to uh, sort of summarize what's going on, what's important in the most plain language as possible, and I also answer questions on my Twitter wherever I can. 
So um, speaking of questions, we have 15 minutes. I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. Hey, uh, the RFQ, so does that actually formalize a curriculum that would then be paid for by the state to some, okay, gotcha. That's absolutely right. Okay, and are you looking for people who have an educational background specifically to kind of write these things, or just, you know, anyone who's got a good idea who, who thinks they can put something together? Um, I would say an educational background would absolutely be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say an educational background is necessary. Um, certainly there are a lot of groups that uh, provide training in these areas that would be relevant experience too. Also, if you have the relevant subject matter expertise and you don't have any training, I would still apply because there's definitely a scarcity of that, that expertise. So, in conclusion, everybody applies. <laughs> yes? In regards to the public comment period, uh, Thursday, Commissioner Doyle had mentioned she would like public comments to meet a certain criteria. Uh, was that just aimed towards attorneys or is that for all public comments? Um, what criteria? So she had mentioned she didn't want to hear anecdotal stories, she wanted to hear actual case law and um, a more formal presentation as if uh, she would be taking it to a uh, Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Um, okay, I 99% of the time would not try and represent what another commissioner meant. This is in the 1% of the time I'm sure that Commissioner Doyle did not meant that she only wanted to hear okay. from lawyers. Um, we are hearing from everybody. Um, but she did say, and I agree with this, that when it comes to the legal arguments, we want to hear from lawyers on both sides, and we want their full legal arguments. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the ancillary and the trade professions, mm -hmm. uh, what is the commission doing, or what is their thoughts around the insurance industry for cannabis? That's a great question. Um, I know that there are, that's a good example, along with bookkeeping, where if you are in that industry, it's going to be completely different. If you're trying to enter the cannabis industry, it's not going to be like a one-day seminar, like it might be with others. So um, I would say that has been contemplated as an area where um, people who are, are eligible from the program could be trained. And you would also look for people that are vendors that want to teach insurance as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Knowing that a lot of hindrances to get licenses are communities and some of the tactics they're using, uh, we have seen at the commission's hearing that, that a lot of these communities are demanding more than the maximum of 3%. We're seeing a lot of that, it's gonna be a hindrance. Is the commission going to help any of these applicants that are being hit with a contract that states that we must give up more than 3%? So, I think it's a common misconception that the commission can just give licenses willy-nilly. We can't. We have to follow the law. And the law very clearly states that a community host agreement must be signed. Beyond that, how do we ensure that the 3% limit on community impact fees is followed? That is certainly the question that is up for debate um, that we are receiving public comment on. I would say if you want to closely follow that um, process, I would encourage watching the meeting from Thursday. I know you were there. Um, I have been very clear about um, my perspective on it. I would say also that the commission is not the only entity that could enforce that cap. I would look into reaching out to your state representatives as well, and certainly your local government. I mean, you could, if you don't like the way it's being handled, you could vote against them or you could run against them. Um, there's all sorts of options here. I think that being vocal is definitely the first step. Would it be something that Attorney General Mara Healy would look into if some of these communities are now demanding more, which is also, a, which is, I believe, a technical violation of the law, would the Attorney General help small businesses and you know, try to you know, counteract those that are in contracts? <clears throat> Um, even though Attorney General Healy is one of my appointing authorities, I couldn't predict um, what that office would do. I would say certainly it's your right as a citizen to contact that office. Other questions? <coughs> In terms of um, assisting uh, with the disproportionately affected communities, um, Aside from just uh, as a person who is now entering the industry myself, I have some existing experience in related industries. 
Um, is it finance? Is any? I guess what I'm wondering is how can I benefit them most? Either is there some office I can contact, or I can, or some group I can contact, where I can offer financial support or additional mentoring or anything like that? Um, I feel like you set me up to. Uh, um, plug the guidance that just came out <laughs> because it's specifically we were getting a lot of questions about that so it specifically goes through the positive impact plan and some examples if you read through it and you don't um, and you still have questions and this goes for everything just contact cannabis commission at mass.gov okay great mm -hmm. i think that was the last question unless anyone else okay thank you all.